Man, YouTube is good at fucking giving me videos. But it fucking blows at giving me movies, dude. Like Venom, maybe I'm interested in. I've seen these two. Oh, yeah. Alec Baldwin interview. I don't know if it's, a, if it's true grief or not, because it didn't come up with that upside down horse. Shooting where. I just said, she goes, yeah, that's good. I let go of the hammer. Bang, the gun goes. We're going to talk about Alec Baldwin. Greg, tell us about the videos we're going to see. Yeah, these videos are from an interview with George Stephanopoulos about the Rust shooting where a cinematographer was killed and the director injured. That's all you need to know. The Ukrainian-born cinematographer quickly gelled with Baldwin. The people who watched The Daily said that her work was beautiful. She was someone who was loved by everyone who worked with and liked by everyone who worked with and admired. What do you got? Yeah, okay. So first off, let's just look at how this whole thing is set up. It's advertised as Baldwin unscripted. So clearly that's a piece of PR, I would say, in that there, our worry is, hey, this is all going to be scripted, isn't it? We want to really hear this, hear the truth of this. And they've kind of seen us off at the past there by going, no, 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 this is totally unscripted in order to um, countermeasure any worries we might have about this. So that that obviously worries me in the first place about this. Um, now that it's that it may be unscripted doesn't mean that it's not designed and it's not uh, structured. And so we're going to see that the interviewer there has um, has notes. Uh, my guess is, is they've structured out these questions. It's not blasé as to how this is going out. There is going to be some preparation, more than some preparation involved in this. Uh, the lighting there, we can see that Baldwin is very, you know, uh, there is a shadow side. Just so happens that the shadow side, the dark side is his gun shooting side as we will his dominant hand as we'll see later on I, you know these things can be accidental but in really good production it's really often not very accidental that that's the way things are set up so already potentially yeah unscripted but by no means unstructured or undesigned in any way let's have a look at the the rhetorical process that he uses there or structure that he uses there loved by everyone liked by everyone and admired that that rule of three piece is actually beautifully structured not necessarily written but could be scripted i mean beautifully put together and that um admired area that's the moment that uh, um, pushes him into an emotion. Now, I guess the, the worry from people is, is, is that emotion real? Is it true? Here's what worries me about it, is the shading of the face. Could be shame, could be shame. There's a lot of good reasons why it could be shame. But what I've noticed about people who are overcome by emotion is they, they forget to protect themselves from everybody seeing it. Feels to me like he wants to protect people from seeing that. Now, is that because of the shame of people seeing the emotion or is it that it's not quite good enough? He doesn't think his performance of that is good enough. I'm not sure. I'd like to hear from everybody else as to what they think about this. But I tell you, it, it doesn't ring quite right uh, for me. Greg, what do you got about this one? Yes, yeah, so I'm going to start by saying when we talk about scripted, I think They're most of this is me. unscripted. By that, I mean, I don't think he had lines prepared for everything. He had areas that he's willing to talk about, those things that he's uncomfortable talking about where he's been coached. And I'll point those out because they're pretty easy to see. You can tell that somebody said, stay away from this, and you'll see it late in the videos. But here I do see, I do see a little grief muscle in him. And whether that's acting, I, you know, I'm not a great Alec Baldwin fan. I know people love him. People hate him. I'm kind of, you know, lukewarm, don't really care. A couple of movies he's done I like and that kind of thing. I've never thought of him as, you know, 
he, he's not Anthony Hopkins. So I don't expect him to be a perfect actor. And in fact, if he's doing this, I'm impressed. I'm actually more impressed than I recall him being as an actor because his grief muscle does engage, although lightly. And him putting his hand up could be face blocking because of shame or that mark. We won't really know. I mean, certainly he feels, you can tell he feels something about this woman as he's starting to talk to her. It does look like it overtakes him rather than something he's prepared. I don't see him what I call going down the well. Of course, he is a real actor, not the people we usually see trying to act and lie, who find a way to draw themselves down into a well to start crying. But so it, it kind of overwhelms him, it looks like. So I think it looks real enough to me, considering I don't typically think of him as that fantastic an actor. Mark, you may have a different opinion. I still don't know how many bullets were shot. That's pattern, like a that big deal. Sales pitch that he always has yeah, when he's you talking. Shoot one, up at the end, down you realize, telling, if you but start shooting like five and times. And he says, like she rolls. was... What word does he use? Two people are injured. Admired. Admired. Mm -hmm. That word is a cell. That is a big cell. That is a, hey, here's who she is. I also don't see, and the reason I don't think this is really prepared and scripted, I don't see a whole lot of left eye accessing. I see him talking and thinking, and we'll see him as he talks storytelling in a way that he does as a person. If you've seen him on like late night interviews, when he's storytelling and talking about something, he... Chase, you call it body narration. He uses his whole body to tell the story, and we're going to see a lot of it. He's using illustrators. His cadence is pretty consistent and that kind of thing. And his cadence even changes when he goes down into this kind of emotional feel. So I, that's what I got. This early in, I'd say, yeah, okay. I, could he be acting? Sure. But if he is, it's probably better than most of his work in the past, in my opinion. Chase, what do you got? So I have an acting friend who is on uh, – a bunch of soap operas, uh, like Young and the Restless, specifically. And he is one of the stars of Young and the Restless. I called him. We know him. To we know figure nice this guy. out. Yeah, you guys have met him. And I talked to a, a few other people, and one of the tricks that I've heard from several people today that is used is peppermint extract to make somebody cry. And I think it's interesting in this clip, the eyes, the upper eyelid goes from normal color to completely red in just about no time. And this is an unusual response for anybody crying. And I think all of us here have talked to people who are in the worst day of their life. And there's only marks. I, that, I think this is interesting. There's only marks on the spots where his hand was touching his face. And I think the instantaneous sniffing uh, was not long, in my opinion, not long enough for tears to form. It's more likely to be an irritant or something that like a peppermint extract that might have cleared the sinuses. And in this video, there's some grief muscle, but there's a lacking movement right here, which if you ever see somebody in grief or shame, this little chin, it's called the chin boss, this movement kind of moving up right there. Uh, is is missing for this video. And finally, the side of his nose that his hand was touching, which is his left side of his nose, was red just as well as his eyelids were red. I think that's interesting. Not saying that it that it absolutely happened, but I think that it's it's definitely something worth looking into and it's something worth considering for the video, especially since since it's such a pervasive uh, technique that uh, from what I've heard today. Uh, Scott, what do you think? All right. Yeah, I agree with you. Did that all, for, so did you watch the, did you do frame by frame for the chin? <clears throat> no. Chase? Okay. Because no. he does get some dimples in there. But man, that comes off pretty quick. The, the whole crying thing hits him pretty fast. I agree with you there. We see a lot of heavy head illustrators. We're dealing with an actor, so almost everything is dramatic. Um, his, head, his head tilts just a little bit when he's trying to say, you know, or tell something serious. His head gets a tilt on it when he says, when he starts talking about something that he's trying to, to point home to validate that statement. Um, there, there are no tears. A lot of sniffling, but there aren't any tears. And I think the forehead movement and the grief muscle, the 
reason we're seeing just a little tiny bit, I call it t- tactical Botox because he really doesn't look like he's been Botox, but man, he has because that happened. You can tell they have been when their eyebrows start dumping down there in the middle. They start like pointing down almost like the evil, whatever it is. And if you look at his eyebrows, I think this is one on his left goes up and is almost pointing up at, at you know, looking for Sputnik one or something. So it, it, he's got that, that, what I call a crash right there in the middle of those heading down. So we do see a little bit, but I, there's not enough there to be able to tell if it's a, if it's true yeah. grief or not because uh, it didn't come up with that upside down horseshoe thing. But I agree with you, Greg. It's there, but it's very small. And what's in the in the chin boss is minimal, minimal. Even frame by frame, you have to go through and watch. It's minimal, but that thing passes by so fast. It you know I'm sure he may have been holding that up and then boom it got away from him. But that was mighty quick to to be a, a full on emotional cry in my opinion anyway other than that everything looks looks normal and as it should in the situation all right you know I, the thing I, I find interesting about grief muscle is it can be so different in different people we've seen folks who it's really pronounced and folks who it's just like a little arch uh, chris uh, was his name christopher mcdaniel the guy in macon georgia with the weird little forehead yeah. thing. Scott, so it can be different on different people and when people cry yeah. it can look very different yeah yeah Ukrainian-born cinematographer. And we see it again, and we see what they meant by that. Then we're going to move to another clip, review it, see it again, move on. Quickly gelled with Baldwin. The people who watched The Daily said that her work was beautiful. She was someone who was loved by everyone who worked with and liked by everyone who worked with and admired. So we're going to look at the grief muscle, which should shape a W here. The chin, not... Uh, the grieving, grieving chin not moving, in this case. The eyes especially turning red. The top, he said, where the hand touches. If, if we, God, see the hand touch. The sniffing, which could be a product. Um, the side here, which would turn red also. Interesting shading also. That's a decision. <laughs> He's completely overwhelmed by the emotion. I would expect some shaking of the hand here. The fuck who am I? I'm sorry. Oh, it's true, yeah. It, it becomes really red. But I didn't see the touch here from the, the hand. I don't I don't think I've seen the hand touch the eyelid at all. Go back for a second here. Admired. It's just over the eyebrow, and this is really light touch. Uh, mostly supported by the cheek bone here. Uh, I don't feel like the... So it's, it's supported by the bone cheek here. And it if you look carefully, there's, there's this big slice. You're not touching anything here. Can you see it? So... Even if it's like that, over the eyeball, you're still not touching the the lid here okay you can clearly see that um and i don't see it touch here on this side he's a friend to him so of course he's he's it's true it's red i mean all of a sudden the eyelids are red but um I don't see the touch. But admired by everybody who... Uh... It's too bad with the shadow. We can't see the other side and the redness, but it does look more red. It seems to be generalized. <laughs> who worked with her? All right. Is there a cut? Was there a cut anywhere in there? Well, I mean, there's a different angle, but I don't think there's a cut in time. By everyone who worked with and liked by everyone who worked with and admired. So genuine, there is no cut in time. But admired by everybody who um who worked with her. All right. Here we go. 
he would be displeased with this analysis, uh, I think. But um, we are. And you were rehearsing that scene. Was it an actual rehearsal? There's some disagreement about that, whether it was a formal rehearsal at that time. This is a marking rehearsal where I'm going to show her. She's standing next to the camera. She's like this. You or me. She's got a monitor here. The camera is here filming that way. She takes a monitor that, his, that is his monitor, the operator, and turns it toward her. It swivels. And she says to me, hold the gun lower. Go to your right. Okay, right there. All right, do that. Now show it a little bit lower. And she's getting me to position the gun. Everything is in her direction. She's guiding me through how she wants me to hold the gun for this angle. And I, I draw the gun out, and I find a mark. I draw the gun out, I find a cut. And what's really urgent is the gun wasn't meant to be fired in that angle. So if you're shooting directly into the camera lens, you're not aiming I'm not shooting it. into the camera lens. I'm shooting just off. Just off. Right, in her direction. I'm holding the gun where she told me to hold it, which ended up being aimed right in below her armpit. That was what I was told. I don't know. This was a completely incidental shot an angle that may not have ended up in the film at all. All right, Chase, what do you got? I think it's, I know you guys are going to cover some of the behaviors in here. I want to cover a couple of the words and some of the words that are there and some of the words that are missing from this, uh, this monologue here. He uses the, the word urgent. So what's really urgent is blah, blah. It wasn't meant to be fired at that angle. And then later, He's not using her name in the videos that we've seen so far. So we're on video two. We're not hearing the victim's name being mentioned at all, which is a strong data point for dissociation from guilt or dissociation wanting to, to separate yourself from that person uh, in the eyes of the person that's watching. So keep an eye or maybe an ear on that in the coming videos, it, does the name come out? I want you to be listening to see if you hear the name be used in some of the, the videos that are coming up. Greg, what do you think? Yeah, so when you say words, urgent, I th So that's interesting, right? The name, the name doesn't come out. It could mean different things, but dissociation is definitely the first thing that comes to mind. Because if you would say, you know, like what... Whatever her name was, I can't remember. Um, please. It doesn't say. Okay. So they, they would say her name, like. It, it means a closeness. When, it, when you don't say it, it's like distances. Because he, he is under, for the lack of better words, under fire. I think what he's trying to get out, and I, I have two words written down, urgent and incidental, urgent and incidental. Urgent On the side of the road, when we did his video, he talked about it being an incidental shooting. And I was like, what the hell does that mean? Well, now I understand what he means. It was just a thing. It was not going to be part of the part of the show. So it was an accidental thing, accidental, incidental shooting, as he referred to it there. You see his baseline come out again. I mean, this guy is we, we've seen him his whole life in front of a camera, so we know his baseline when he's being interviewed is that animated kind of guy, and he's doing that. But he story tells with his whole body. He puts you in the position. He makes you part of the story, and that's who he is. He's just bringing him in. When he says that incidental, I wonder, is that scripted? And the reason it's come up twice is it's something that's in his head. He's been told, hey, this is incidental. It's not. It was not intended to be part of the, of the movie, and something went wrong. I don't know, but it comes up twice, so it, it means something. It's not a word I would typically use all the time, or, nor would he. Um, and other than that, the only thing I see in terms of scripted is that he's trying to avoid certain words and get certain words out, like that urgent word that meant something to him. This, it's urgent that you know this, I think is what he means by it, not it urgent. the thing that is urgent. The other thing is I don't see him accessing left. I don't see him doing any of that kind of stuff, like he's recalling something he's memorized. Um, and then he does it, this? look off to the he's to the right and pulling, doing that pulling taffy move as he's trying to get approval from the guy. And then his head drops down to the right. And as he says, incidental, his head is shaking. No, as if, you know, futility, you see that in him, but all of his arrows are aligned in the story he's telling, which is kind of interesting. One interesting note is when he talks about these dummy rounds, because I'm going to assume most people that watch us may or may not know a thing about guns. And it's okay for us to talk about this. When he talks about dummy rounds, what he means 
is a round that looks exactly like a regular round. A round is a combination of a cartridge with powder and a cap and a bullet. And the bullet is the thing that goes out the barrel. Whether you know that or not, some of you are going to go, yeah, of course, but some of you don't know. And in a blank, there is no bullet at the end. They put these bullets in the chamber, in the little wheel part of the gun, so that folks like me don't look at it and go, well, you're not shooting anybody with that when they're holding it up to the camera. And so they have these dummies, and it's only as good as how well they build those dummies. I don't know what Hollywood standard is. It could have no cap so you can tell from the back. It could have something else. But if it doesn't. No, 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 no. It does. Uh, decoy rounds don't have any markings because you put them on tables and you take film and you take shots, film, pictures, videos, chats. The decoy rounds don't have any markings because you want to take a video of what looks like a real bullet. But dummy rounds, fake rounds, rounds that explode but don't pro don't have a projectile are clearly marked at the end, and they can be punched also, uh, in in the in the um, the back if you want where the hammer hits the bullet. That's marked. I think it's green. And uh, it clearly looks like, so when you look at the revolver inside of it, you will see green dummy rounds that make a sound and a flash, and you shouldn't be standing next to it, but it doesn't shoot a bullet. Dummy rounds are marked? No. Fake? I don't, I don't know what the words are. Some fakes, fake bullets, are not marked for decoy. Call them decoy, their decorations on a set, and dummy rounds are marked with a green line or green colors. You would have to literally take that round out of that gun and shake it around, pick it up to know the weight difference is the only way you'd be able to tell. So it, it's really easy for us to assign blame and say he should have checked. But in the kind of gun we're talking about, you would literally, Chase, you know, you'd have to take this little thumb ramrod and push each round out turn the wheel take each round out and check it and so i can understand so and i don't think an actor has to do that and and does an actor need by law to take a course on how to handle guns and stuff if they use it on sets i don't think they do dude i think this is the job of the armory and they are the ones responsible for props gun props and and, and live rounds being used on sets and fake rounds. I don't think it's the job of the actor. I don't think we're going to find him guilty in any way unless he shot, or charged even, unless he shot multiple shots and at some point it's getting a little strange that he didn't stop shooting. So we don't know how many bullets were fired. But if he just shot one or tr two or even three, I don't think we're going to see any charges here. And wife using cosmetic for him or dummy rounds he personally would not check it every time and it, that's you'll hear a lot of people saying that i'm not taking his side one way or the other but i will say there's logic to his discussion here and i think that's an important part of this tab scott what do you have all right uh again receive he's an excellent story tip. and all of this needs to link completely well with his grief right if 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 he knew Right, and then he grieves. It doesn't link very well those two together. But if he didn't know, and he's really grieving, he's telling a true story. All of this matches. I think we're going to see that from Alec, and we're going to see a lack of experience from the armory uh, side of things and the set production security. I think we're going to see that. Unfortunately, they're under pressure. They they like they I think they lacked experience and. But where did that live bullet come from, and why was it in the gun? That's that's a question for the armor, you know, armory. Teller, you know, he's in dramatic, and 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 his thing is stories, is telling stories through film, as they do. So that's why he sets this scene up perfectly. I mean, it's almost like you're there as he as he describes it. And that's really great. Again, his illustrators are large, and that's what helps do that. They're descriptive illustrators. They go along. Part of the definition of illustrators is not just. Uh, emphasizing specific words or phrases, but building things in boxes. Uh, Chase has a word for it. What's the word you use, Chase? I use body narration. 
Body narration. Great word. Um, Great term. Yeah. So uh, his, they're really, really descriptive. And Bodies. people communicate in three ways. They, 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 when you run into a person who's an auditory person, they'll talk about hearing things and the way things sound. It sounds good to me. That sounds good. Those kind of things. You hear a person who's into to, uh, the visual uh, communication, like most people are in movies or people are into movies. They'll, when they talk about things, they'll say, it look like this. Here's what it looks like to me. That brooch she's wearing uh, looks a little heavy or whatever. And, and then you have kinesthetic, which is the person who talks about things, how things feel and everything. So he's a, a, a visual person. That's why he's always making these big um, illustrators describing and actually building pictures of these things, which see, we see he gets more into it here in a few minutes. There's an edit when he said in, in between, uh, she's getting me in, and she's getting me to position the gun. Then there's the edit. And then he says everything is in her direction. So I don't know what they got out there, but there's a complete change of scene there. If you listen to it, you'll hear it. That's what first got got me paying attention to it. And then when I watch it, he's a little bit forward, but then he's all back and everything looks different. Doesn't and you can fuck. hear um, Stephanopoulos say something during that edit, which they've tried to block out, but it came through on the on the other mic or in the room sound. So after he's after he mimes that pulling the gun thing, he says, "What's really urgent is like you guys were saying." He used that the last time we 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 uh, broke his stuff down. And he said, "It's urgent that you know, or it's urgent that something." So that must be one of his little words he uses all the time. And then when he says the gun was meant to be fired, wasn't meant to be fired in that angle. Like he's smiling, and the smile stays at the end of that. I think this is the first little brick in, and we're seeing in his wall of "I didn't do it. It's not my fault." In other words, and I'll bet you a hundred bucks when it comes to the trial, well, that must be one of his little words he uses all the time. What did he say? And then when he says the gun was meant to be fired, wasn't meant to be fired in that angle, he's smiling and the smile stays at the end of that. I think this is the first little brick in, and we're seeing in his wall of, I didn't do it. It's not my fault. In other words, and I'll bet you a hundred bucks when it comes to the trial, we'll hear that, uh, that, that similar phrase, if not the very same thing, how he talks about uh, how he sets that up the very same way. I know I, I'm under the impression that's going to happen. Um, and after the next question, his posture is perfect. Everything straightens up. Oops. And he's, he's sitting like this and he looks, he looks pro. He looks like everything. He looks confident and all that. And he says, uh, I'm holding the gun where she, where she told me to hold it. Again, there's brick two. As he starts building this little wall of it, it's not me. It's I was a victim here as well. And I agree with it. It bugs me. He doesn't say her name. It, uh, so far, he hasn't said her name up to this point so far. Um, mm -hmm. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, yeah. So just the name is so it's so interesting. When you get to know somebody on such a personal basis, and they are your friend. I mean, these two were producers together. These two were friends. Okay, so of course you're going to refer to your friend by their names. You're not just going to say he he told me to do that. She told me to do this, and and I did this for her or for him. And, and they wanted that, and that's such a distance. That's such a distance, you know, between. Um, and, and why create that distance if it's not necessary, you know? Like, you know, um, you know, Mark asked me to, to point the gun at him, but it was really close to him, but it wasn't on him, but, but, but he wanted that. You know, Mark said this, and, and Jane said to do that, and... Jane wanted that. It's so different. It's like much closer. Why is it such a, a distant thing? You know? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, that smile comes, and I think we've seen it before in other work of his that we've we, or, or interviews or roadside stops that we've looked at. That smile comes when he believes somebody else has made a mistake, and I do believe we see it there, and we will see it later on. Uh, so I, I totally agree with that. Um, what I would say, he, it, like you said, uh, Scott, he's a very good mime. Um, I, I know people like it when I break down words, mime from the Latin mimosis to copy. So he's very good at copying stuff and doing what we call illusionary mime, which is to create the illusion of something that's there that isn't actually physical. So he's great at going, hey, you're me. Uh, you know, she's looking at the monitor like this. He's very clear about 
cocking you know the gun back here and and later on as well so so and, and very definite look as an actor one of the things you need to be able to do especially in film especially in film is hit your mark exactly and time and time again get props get items get your face get your hand exactly where, where the director of photography wants your face and your hands because they're trying to create the most beautiful picture uh, possible so you have to be able to do that time and time again so we should expect his mime his geography of this story to be spot on and and we should expect that that it doesn't change at any point and i believe it is spot on i believe we see him describe this very 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 clearly and he says with downward intonation i'm not shooting at the camera lens okay and he's mapped that out as well he's very clear tonally that that he isn't shooting at the camera lens this, this marks that he has a good memory of the events. Overall, he has a good memory of things. So he can't say, oh, I don't remember. Oh, I, I really don't remember that. Oh, I don't remember. When you clearly have such a detailed memory of the events, you know. And so that can come up in trial. And he's already mapped that. If we're having difficulty getting some answers out for us and um and when he says that as well his hands are on his knees there's no adapters there's no self-soothers so i think you know the the biggest thing i take from this particular um piece of footage here is this is what he looks like when he's telling you the truth okay this is what he looks like when he's very very clear of exactly what happened and then oh, there's that slight upturn of the mouth there and slight smile of this is what he looks like as well when he thinks somebody else has done something wrong. And he also does start to st set up in his narrative there that the he was under the control or under the orders of the director of photography. This is verificable, verifiable, verificating, verificationable. People, I, you can verify that because... These are not the only two people in the scene, you know, in the production. There's other people. There's the sound guy. There's the, the other producer, editor. They're probably all of there. And they can say, yes, she asked him to do this. She asked him to do that. She was there also in the line of fire. And so this is verifiable as well. So he's already started to shift, I think, as, as Chase might say, that kind of locus of control away from him and towards somebody else. So I interesting uh, second film there. That's what I got for you. And Scott, I think to your point, when he when there's the edit there, I think he was asked a present tense question to put him in the present moment because he switches to past tense to present. So I am, or she's doing this to me. So those are all present. Okay. So I think the question that Stephanopoulos asked him was something, okay, so you're here and you're doing this. So what's happening now? So a, a question to kind of put him in present and get him to describe mm -hmm. the scene better. I think mm -hmm. that's what was edited out. Yeah. So the present, probably the reason I, it's the first time I hear that past versus present in the analysis. Present when you're saying I am I'm there I'm doing this I'm that this is recalling memory I think in a more accurate way than saying well I did this and I did that because then you're accessing just plain memory whereas if you're saying I am doing this and then I'm pointing that way and then I'm moving you're like reliving it and it's it's different than just accessing memory images of the past. You have to branch them together. And when you do that, they need to make sense to you, you know, and, and you might remember a detail. Oh yes, before that image, from image A to image B in the past, I remember doing this. And so it will help you remember better. I like it. And you were rehearsing that scene. Was it an actual rehearsal? There's some disagreement about that, whether it was a formal rehearsal at that time. This is a marking rehearsal where I'm going to show her. She's standing next to the camera. She's like this. You or me. She's got a monitor here. The camera is here filming that way. She takes a monitor that, his, that is his monitor, the operator, and turns it toward her. It swivels. And she says to me, hold the gun lower. Go to your right. Okay, right there. All right, do that. Now show it a little bit lower. And she's getting me to position the gun. Everything is in her direction. That's 
we can see here the mistake from the producer who is not being careful with what's going on. I'm not sure if you're understanding what he's saying here. Okay. He's saying there's a camera. Motherfucker, can you see me? There's a there's a fucking camera. Okay. And the camera's pointing at you. You're the actor, chat. Act 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 up right now. You're the actor. This is a camera. So I need to draw. And the producer could be behind the camera looking through the camera at you or the producer the, so they don't look necessarily at through a camera lens now they look at a screen and so the screen can pivot like that and oh my god like this around the camera in other words the person looking at the camera can be on the side of the camera while the camera is looking at you okay and so if the first creation of the scene so that you don't point the gun at someone was that the producers here and you point oh my god dude I'm gonna lose my shit producers here and you point the gun in this direction what happens if another producer comes in steps here and turns the camera, the, 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 the screen around to look at it. And now suddenly they're in the crossfire. Okay. Is it his responsibility to tell her that? Because she doesn't know. She's looking at a screen like this, which looks good for her. But she never realizes that the gun is pointing straight at her when she says, shoot or fire. It's at her. She doesn't realize that and that can't happen it's just a, a technical mistake her chin a little bit lower and she's getting me to position the gun everything is in her direction she's guiding me through how she wants me to hold the gun for this angle and i, I draw the gun out and i find a mark i draw the gun out i put a cut and what's really urgent is the gun wasn't meant to be fired in that angle so if you're shooting directly into the camera lens you're not aiming i'm not shooting it. into the camera lens i'm shooting just off just off right in her direction i'm holding the gun where she told me to hold it which ended up being aimed right in below her armpit was what i was told i don't know this was a completely incidental shot an angle that may not have ended up in the film at all. Yeah. What you're never supposed to do when you handle guns, even when you take sh pictures uh, on a set, you're never supposed to really point it at someone. It looks like you are, and it's a job of the producer to make sure that it looks like you are, but you never really are pointing the nozzle directly at a human body you're pointing it a little off to it but it just looks like it and through editorial process you can make it look like that you are it's like someone's throwing a punch and uh, you hit me good there but you never did but we kept doing this new so then i said to her now in this scene i'm going to cock the gun and i said do you want to see that and she said yes so i take the gun and i start to cock the gun i'm not going to pull the trigger i, I said do you see that she goes, well just cheat it down and tilt it down a little bit like that and i cock the gun i go can you see that can you see that can you see that and she says and then i let go of the hammer of the gun and the gun goes off i let go of the hammer of the gun and the gun goes off at the moment the that was the moment the gun went off, yeah. That was the moment the gun went off. It wasn't in the script for the trigger to be pulled. Well, the trigger wasn't pulled. I didn't pull the trigger. So yeah. you... that, that's, that was a huge revelation, right? The, the trigger not being pulled. But the hammer itself, it's a revolver. So the hammer, he's, he's basically saying that he doesn't, he wasn't, he doesn't know how to cock a, a, a hammer. Or, which I don't, by the way. Nobody fucking does. And, 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 or, and, and then it released because he didn't cock it properly, right? All the way to the end, or that the gun had a malfunction or a broken part. And when he cocked it to the end, something broke or something was already broken and released the hammer into the bullet. And that bullet happened to be a live bullet. Was there other live bullets? 
You never pulled the trigger. No, 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 no. I, I would never point a gun at anyone and pull a trigger at them, never. Never. That was the training that I had. You don't point a gun at me and, and pull the trigger at them. On day one of my instruction in this business, people said to me, never take a gun and go click, 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 because even though it's incremental, you damage the firing pin on the gun if you do that. Don't do that. All right, Greg, what do you got? So here now I start to see him delivering his story. If you don't believe he has something he wants to get out, whether it's a scripted story or, as you put it, uh, Scott, building a wall, when he hits points he wants to get across, he double states every one of those key points. And if you can look for it when he says things like, I did not point at her, I would not point at her, I did not... Uh, I would never point and pull the trigger. The interesting piece for me, so go back and listen, and you'll hear three different places. Go back and listen to the three different places. He doubles the statement. Never. Never. Doubles down, double statement. That's so interesting. I didn't point at her. I didn't shoot her. I didn't pull the gun. No, I didn't, I didn't pull the trigger. No, I never did that. No, 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 I never did that. And then he looks away when he's telling his story and when he's showing how he cocked the gun and all those kinds of things. No eye contact at all. When he starts to make real eye contact is when he's talking about, well, my training, boom, 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 boom. And he's pulling his finger like he's firing a trigger. He makes good eye contact. So I think it's important to him to get across the meaning of what matters. And then when there's something as throwaway, for example, this, you know, this gun training from his first time that pull the trigger, pull the trigger, pull the trigger, then he makes good eye contact. So interesting, interesting that he's trying to get across content, that he is double telling certain points. And he shows distaste or disdain or something right after that. Disdain is asymmetric from, from if I remember correctly, if I have a fucking memory. And it, he, you, this Dane, you see it like this. It's like on the side a little bit. It's off in the mouth. And it's asymmetric. It's only one side. That was the training I had. That kind of half-faced, draw back the side of the face. Something's going on in his head there. Here's the thing. We can see what's going on. We can't tell you what That's is causing it, what inside his brain is causing that. It could be something internal. That he's disappointed in himself, that he has something to do with that. It could be that he is pissed at Stephanopoulos because he asked him a hard question that he was not ready for. It could be the situation, the entire situation. We can't tell that. We can see the, the symptoms. We can't tell the cause. And that's, we always say, we don't read minds as much as Scott's friends think we're in the mind reading business. We're actually looking for symptoms and we try to figure it out from there. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I agree with you. We're still not seeing a mention of the victim's name, uh, which is a data point here, especially during these heated, intense moments, we're not seeing that stuff. But we're seeing a ton of repetition. And as a, as a behavioral expert, if I'm ever talking about brainwashing or this mind control stuff and how to control people's thoughts, if I could sum it all up in one word, it would be repetition. And there is a ton of repetition here. He's saying, can you see that? Can you see that? Can you see that? We've got three times. He says, I let go of the hammer of the gun and the gun goes off. That's twice repeated. And that was the moment the gun went off, repeated twice again. Trigger wasn't pulled. I didn't pull the trigger. You don't pull the trigger. I would never pull the trigger. Then he says, click, 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 click over and over again. So there's tons of repetition here that I have never once in my life of analyzing video and interrogations and uh, all kinds of videos. I've never seen uh, statements like this with this much repetition inside the statement. Typically, uh, when never in his life, and he's he's really experienced, dude. He's he's seen a lot. He's seen a lot of stuff. He's saying there's a lot of repetition, the most ever. When I see lots of repetition, there was probably a bullet list that an attorney provided to that person, or there was a bulletized list with some very very key data points that need to be hammered down. So the person by default starts to repeat those things. And he's saying, you never point a gun at somebody. The entire point of having guns in movies. We're trying to understand where the repetitiveness comes from and why. Well, because it's repetitive and it's short, then you can only talk about a few things because you're repeating the same things. So, of course, what comes up is a, a bulletized idea of, of things that you're allowed to say. Definitely spoke with a lawyer before and, and said, look, I want to do an interview about this. Here's what I would say. And the, the lawyer went and scratched out a few things he shouldn't be saying and just left out things he could, he should be saying or could be saying. And so that's what 
comes up to mind. This is just, I mean, regular practice here. Even giving an interview is just so surprising. Sets 90% of the time is to point them at somebody and then pull the trigger. So when we say like this weapon safety laws would have stopped everything, maybe not because a lot of times in the movies, that's the purpose of having the gun there. There's gunfights and guns are being pointed at people. There's a lack of emotion throughout this. There's a lack of emotion throughout speaking about the event uh, on the face. And this is scientifically proven in peer reviewed journals all over the world that we have facial expressions that are pretty much universal. You could point a fake gun at someone. Um, that would be fine on a set. It looks like a real gun, but it's a fake gun. And there's a distinction here. You can use a real gun with fake bullets, or you could use a fake gun and then you know, point at people. It's a toy. It needs to be clearly marked as a fake gun. Uh, somewhere, somehow, probably in the handle, because you're holding it. But that, that would be safe, of course. And we're not seeing hardly... But even then, is it completely safe? Probably not. Because it's shaped like a real gun. Which you wouldn't... Any of that throughout this. And there's a lack of hesitancy here, which is unusual for a person who's just gone through something traumatic. This is their first big TV appearance to talk about everything. We, we would typically see some hesitation here, some stopping to think, which we will see in a future video. But there's, it's very on uh, message here. So we're seeing a lot of, a lot of uh, maybe not, I won't say scripted because the whole thing's titled unscripted, but there is, there is some rehearsal. I'll say Prepared that. content. Yeah, prepared <laughs> content. Uh, Mark. Yeah, so uh, so I agree that repetition of those words is it PR message? That's a possibility. Is it self soothing? This is a stress point for him, and so the repetition is around self soothing. Could be that. Um, is it even maybe that he isn't getting the response that he wants from the interviewer? You know, I I, I pulled it back, I let it go, and that's when the gun went off. Maybe he was expecting the interviewer to go. Oh, that's when the gun went off, right? So you didn't pull the trigger. No, I never pulled the. Oh, so you didn't pull the trigger. I think he might be expecting a, a moment of revelation in the audience and the interviewer, and he doesn't get that back, and so he repeats again. Like this is the moment where you suddenly realise I'm not culpable. This is an accident. I don't know which one of those it is. It possibly it's all of the above. It's very possible very possible in his mind that he expected right which expecting expectations suck by the way but when if you would have expected the person to say oh wow that's when the gun went off okay and then he said yeah yeah finally it's out you know but no he doesn't even get that he's like so you never pulled the trigger no i never pulled the trigger i never pulled the trigger he's back into the defensive um aspects and, and he wants to be able to get out of that because that's stressful. It's been going on for a month or two. He's tired of it. His family's tired of it. His relationship is tired of it. He can't. He can't. I'm not quite sure, or some of some of one and some of the other, but but it is interesting. I, um, Greg, I get it as well. The disdain on you don't point a gun at someone and pull the trigger. That's for me when I see the disdain. Now, disdain or contempt, it tends to be a social thing. It tends to be that somebody has done something wrong. And just as Greg said, it could be internal or, or, or external. I did something against the group, or somebody else did something against the group. So. It is it that, look, he really should have known not to just half cock and let go of it, should have known that. And so it's, it's disdain against himself or somebody should have checked the gun more thoroughly. It's disdain against the other person. But ultimately that we see disdain, that means a social rule has been broken. And he says, look, first day, first day I was taught this. So like this is, he goes back to his initiation within the group and says, this is the thing that you never ever a break and somebody somewhere has broken the rules of our group but he did he pointed the gun at someone but he didn't click click like he said you know he should have said 
hold on, hold on, producer, and just cut through the, the scene and said, look, I'm pointing the gun at you right now. It's dangerous. Can we do something else? I'm currently pointing a gun at you. You know, just at least say that. But he didn't do that. You know, which which he may never forgive himself for. You know, as an actor, he's he has some kind of moral responsibility to say, look, producer, produ production, I'm pointing the gun at someone in this angle. Uh, can we move that person around? Can I, you know, he could have said that. There's nothing wrong with doing that. He's on a film set. He knows how to do this. He knows to do this. Um, but again, let's just lastly go back to the geography of this. We see that the finger is straight. He's telling us, I don't have my finger uh, on the trigger there. You know, so, so the geography makes a lot of sense. And he's a good mime and he should be able to reproduce exactly what's going on. So, so I, I buy a lot. You know, like ultimately we may hold him responsible somewhat. You know, if even if he's not responsible in the eyes of the law, I feel like socially, you know, through all the means and the, the, the regulations and the courses that actors and producers and, and armories take, that he committed a fault by working on that gun while it was pointed at someone and he knew, or, or did he not knew because it was dark, I don't know, you know. So if he didn't know, then it sucks that people are going to assume that he knew and he's going to be blamed at some point to have some amount of fault here for pointing that gun in her direction. Unfortunately, it's going to taint the rest of his life and his relationships. Um, it's concerning, of course. A lot of what he's saying there. I'm interested in the repetition, uh, just as everybody else is. Scott, what do you got? But maybe not anymore. Right. Into um, after he's, he describes up to the point of the of the discharge, after he talks about all the moments coming up to that, uh, everything changes. He starts talking a little bit quieter. He gets really still, as you would, because you're coming up on something pretty heavy. And then, um, at, and we haven't seen that up to this point, obviously. Um, and I think the disdain and stuff you guys are talking about, that contempt, I don't think that's what it is. When you look at Trump, and, and Greg po uh, pointed this out, he does a sniff thing. Every time he makes a point or he scores something, he does this. And it's kind of Barney, Barney Fife-esque is, is the idea I got from that. And I, I did the thing where I slowed it down, so I sped it up, slowed it down. There is no sniff there, but I think that's what I think that's what that is. That That's what it looks like to me, and that's what we're all about, what it looked like to each one of us. So, right. so I think what we're seeing is him is going like that. I don't think it's, it's, uh, um, I don't think it's disdain. It could be Mark. Cause I started thinking about that when you said that, cause when I first saw it, I said, ah, oh, and Amber actually pointed out to me, she said, look at that. And I was like, yeah, but I, that, it, it's a tough call on that. But I think it's more of, of, of counting things he's, he, that he's scored on. Cause at that point, what, what he's talking about there again is going to, is going to come up in, in his, um, court case against a little brick to put up for his wall which is he's got a pretty good foundation for it so far all right that's what i got you good hey one, one quick note i wondered about that scott the only reason mm -hmm. i didn't think that is because mark what you said about him repeating i wondered if he was insecure as a reason he's repeating 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 and then i thought well he, he didn't win he doesn't look like he's winning to me so I, I had the same thought about the trump thing i thought maybe he's just doing something like that but yeah he's yeah. he's I, I think he's insecure in this video Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a tough call on that one. But we kept doing this. So then I said to her, now in this scene, I'm going to cock the gun. And I said, do you want to see that? And she said, yes. So I take the gun and I start to cock the gun. I'm not going to pull the trigger. I, I said, do you see that? She goes, well, just cheat it down and tilt it down a little bit like that. And I cock the gun. I go, can you see that? Can you see that? Can you see that? And she says, and then I let go of the hammer of the gun and the gun goes off. I let go of the hammer of the gun and the gun goes off. Were you instructed to let go of the hammer? Because clearly all of this is being instructed, 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 instructed. And then he says, and then I let go of the hammer and the gun goes off. Were you instructed to let go of the hammer was the the shot, I'm trying to talk, talk in film terms here, was the shot uh, supposed to be a firing gun? Probably. 
especially if it had a round in it. And they were expecting fireworks, you know? Was it really supposed to be a half-cocked shot? You know, just a click. Was that really the shot that was supposed to be? Or was he supposed to cock it completely? Cock it completely. And then pull the trigger. Was that supposed to be the shot that they wanted to take? I have a hard time seeing. I think, I think it's just more probable to be that. Rather than half a, sh a cock let go. But hey... We'll find out. At the moment. The decisive that was the moment, moment the gun went off, yeah. That was the moment the gun went off. It wasn't in the script for the trigger to be pulled. Ooh. Ooh, that's the question I want. Oh, that is so good. That is such the, the right question. Was it in the script? It, it, he's just asking exactly what we're asking. And Alec here is, is really thinking about that question carefully. And look at that answer. Is he going to talk about the script? Or is he just going to say, I never, I never pulled the trigger? And completely bypass the question, which is about the script in the first place. Let's watch. Well, the trigger wasn't pulled. I didn't pull the trigger. Oh my god, he's completely bypassing the question. Oh my goodness. He's not answering the question of the script. Why? Maybe because he's nervous, it's an interview, and he's not really actually thinking about the question, which could be possible, but he, he didn't say, no, it was never in the script. The, the script was, we half-cocked the gun, let it go. That's not what he's saying. He, he's not saying, yes, the script was that we pulled the trigger. He's not actually talking about it. He's saying, I never pulled the trigger, which is what he wants to end up saying right possibly because people think he's pulling the trigger so at some point he wants to say in his first interview i never pulled the trigger so that might just be what's in front here what's ready to come out because we're here now and we don't want to miss our chance to say this so you never pulled the trigger no 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 i, I would never point a gun at anyone and pull a trigger at them never never that was the training that i had you don't point a gun at me and, and pull the trigger at on day one of my instruction in this business, people said to me, never take a gun and go click, 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 because even though it's incremental, you damage the firing pin on the gun if you do that. Don't do that. Right. So you have this Colt 45, you just pulled... The hammer as far back as I could without cocking the actual... And you're holding on to the hammer. I'm holding that. I'm just showing. I go, how about that? Does that work? You see that? Do you see that? Is that? She goes, yeah, that's good. I let go of the hammer. Bang, the gun goes. Well, everyone is horrified. They're shocked. Uh, it's loud. They don't have their earplugs in. No one was. There. The gun was supposed to be empty. I was told I was handed an empty gun. If there were cosmetic rounds, nothing with a charge at all, a flash round, nothing. She goes down. I thought to myself, did she faint? All right, uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so I, I see a lot of whole body illustration again, and then really over the top, bang. I mean, he looks excited in a way. If I shot someone, I probably would go and then bang, you know, but who knows? I mean, he's a storyteller. That's what he does. The only time he makes eye contact and is focused on Stephanopoulos is when he's not giving details. Is that something that he's been coached? Don't know. Is it just instinctive for him not to look him in the eyes when he's talking about something that's this big a deal? I can't tell you that. I can tell you he does not look Stephanopoulos in the eyes when he's working through details. That might mean he's trying to remember something. He's trying to remember the details as tightly and accurately as he can. But he does a lot of downright eye accessing. And I know you know you guys are not on the same play, plate I am exactly about eye movement, but downright eye accessing is about as close to a universal as I go. As I go. Most everybody, when they're thinking about something emotional, is going to go drop down into their right. He does a lot of that. And then you can see he's trying trying to sync with him. He'll turn his head to him a little, and he's trying to sync with him and get some approval. And then when he's talking about the gun was supposed to be empty, he turns his head to a different location than he's had to now and kind of does that drawing with his eyes for, ex for acceptance. He's doing an oblique angle as he's talking to him. Then he goes downright, as I was told. 
it's all right chat we're all scrubs these guys are pros dude they see all of these things dude they see everything that he's doing old his illustrators sink and then his face goes to some kind of confusion or something going on dude, with him trash and i wondered bad, did she faint so there's something going on in his head here i think he, those are real feelings and i don't think this is if he were trying to project powerful emotion it wouldn't look like that confusion would probably not be the emotion he came up with he would come up with sorrow or grief or something like that so i don't think that part's scripted i think he's telling the truth how he felt what he saw and that's what i got scott what do you have all right um and now he's all worked up and excited real big so he's uh um, his cadence speeds up again and um his finger his fake finger gun comes up a little bit higher as well now let me ask you guys this when you are when we're explaining something for a sh uh, shooting a gun do you do this or do you do this or do you, do, you do, do this I do the grip. So, so it would look like that i do the grip you know, grip, your yeah. finger would or, be, or that, would yeah. Be, really? Yeah. yeah. So that's. I mean, isn't gun security? Oh my God, dude, this camera. Isn't gun security to be supposed to be finger off the trigger? Why we end up like this? How is this camera fucking so ass, dude? Oh wow. No, but really, like grip. That's the grip, right? Finger on the trigger. Finger off the trigger. Oh my god. Okay. <laughs> it's really odd. It does look like he's he. I don't think he's around as many guns as, as he's coming on like he is. I don't think he's from he's he's familiar with actually going out and shooting them. So good or bad, uh, maybe I don't know, just on that. set. And it, we don't think of a gun as something for a set. We're thinking about bracing because of impact and shooting yeah. is part of the reason why. Yeah, so he starts talking even faster, and then uh, when he, especially when he says, "I was told I was handed an empty gun." That's speeding up there. I can that that's understandable because he's excited about this at this point. Then he said, "She goes down." I thought to myself, "Did she faint?" Let me ask you something. If we're in a room, and you hear a gunshot, and you see somebody on the floor, two people, one guy screaming, and one girl on the floor, a woman on the floor, are you going to say, "I wonder if she fainted"? No. You're not gonna. You're not gonna wonder if she fainted. You're gonna know exactly what happened. You're gonna know exactly what happened at that point. So, well, exactly. And I like what he said. First off, he said you're gonna hear. Did Did Mr. Baldwin say nobody heard anything? We We didn't hear anything. He had something in his ears or something. I mean, who cares about the rest? If he did have something in his ears, and first off, why the fuck would you have something in your ear? Because it, it goes off. And if something goes off, you shouldn't be pointing it at someone. Anyways. Well, I mean, not anyways, because this is all relevant, but... He's fucking right. Like, there's a guy injured, and she's shot. And then the, the bullet went through, I suppose, and, and, and hit somebody else, because another person is injured in this story. So, unless there's more bullets fired, there's only one bullet fired... One guy is, is, is screaming because he's been fucking shot, okay, and he's, he's hit, all right? So you're hit, you go like, what the fuck, you know, you, you, you fucking do something, dude. And then she falls, and of course there's a loud, the loudest fucking bang that you've ever f heard in your life, you know? It's a revolver, and people are screaming and falling. So why would you go, did she faint? Did she faint means you're not hearing anything? You're not seeing anything else? And she's the only one acting up, which is not, I mean, that's three things that are improbable here. This is where he starts getting a little bit on my, um, on my nerves with when he starts down this road. And I'll uh oh, Scott, Scott is getting pissed off. People are getting on his nerve. With their fucking stories greg knows he's like uh-oh scott's gonna get roused up it there mark what do you got yeah on on that exact exact moment scott i get an asymmetrical turn up of the mouth it's not enough for me to go that's that's duper's delight i don't think it's that it's not enough for me to go it's disgust or disdain but something is odd about that it doesn't 
something's odd about that that moment. Um, yeah, I agree. If 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 a if, a, if you know uh, there's a bang, there's a gun, and there's a bang, and somebody falls over, the first thing I would worry is something's loaded. Somebody's been shot. That's not somebody fainting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but anyway, look, um, look how clear he is about bang. Uh, the gun goes off and he does this strike, this out gesture. You're out. One would also ask, we, we don't expect people to faint very often, but do people faint more on movie sets and, and you know, than most? And if the answer is yes, then the answer becomes a little more probable. Gesture. Uh, only so really really emphatic at that point again this is the body language of a storyteller uh, a good mime who's telling you exactly what went on uh, no doubts about it on that also in the plane mark would say it's in the plane of the belly which is uh is it the honest plane is the honest plane is it in the region of the heart where it's the passion plane so he, sp he spoke about that in the last videos then very interesting for me later on he does this lean forward and side into the into the face maybe that side on the camera can't remember but essentially he's doing the mime of just talking into the interviewer's ear because he wants to they then say something quite intimate to him it's this idea of let me tell you something just between you and me the the gun was supposed to be empty the gun was supposed to be empty and then we see what i talked about before that what i would call that righteous smile from him of look this is between you and me this is somebody else's fault i'm not culpable on this now look you know eventually uh courts will will decide fault, decide you. that but ultimately i think you know he has a, a very fixed idea at the moment that uh somebody else is culpable and and you know between you and me he should he should let he should let people know that little bit secretly, a little bit covertly, just so we all know. Let's not shout it out Look loud, out but let's just say it quietly. Uh, that's all I've got on that one. Are we all done? Chase? What? <laughs> What's going on? All right, let me go again. Chase, uh, I'm a keeper. I'm keeper. What do you got? No, of course you are. Of course you are. But I, I want people to see. I want people to see how it could have been. You know how it could have been. I want them to see just how it. This, this, okay. this, this panel is, is what a great handover looks like. Okay. And, and that's all I've got on that one. Chase, Scott should have done. What do you got? Oh, you talked over my handover. You know I'm going to have to do Everybody it. Everybody looks serious. Everybody no, looks really you're all into talking it. over my handover. Quiet, please. <laughs> Quiet on the set. Quiet on the set. Okay. And that's all I've got on that one. Chase, what do you got? Thanks for being so professional, Mark. Let Thank you. Start off by saying <laughs> there's more repetition here. There's more repetition just like last time, and there's more repetition here if you didn't see that yet. Uh, but you don't want I want to see you me to two, three guns? of the person we're looking at, not as a normal person. This is almost an outlier type of person which is when we typically see outlier behaviors. But one of the things we're hearing oh, at the beginning of this is him anyway. telling us this almost like he's reading a screenplay. And please keep in mind, this guy probably reads screenplays for a living. He probably gets 50 of them shipped to his house every day. But he's saying everyone's horrified. They are shocked. It is loud. They don't have their earplugs. This is straight out of third person POV from fiction. This is straight third person POV out of a screenplay. So, again. Yeah, like the point is he's saying, he's not saying, I see that they don't have anything in their ears. I see them fall. I see, I see. He's not necessarily saying that. He's saying, this is what's happening. This is what's going on. It's like a third, it's a third person. And it's describing the scene. Which would also be, I feel quite natural. Uh, if When you're describing the scene. It's just so, it, it's so ingrained in his regular business of everyday business, you know, of doing things. 
reading scripts and acting them out, you know. We're not hearing a name. We're not hearing the name of the actual victim here. And when he talks about her going down, there's just this simple jerk of the hand. It's really abrupt. There's not a whole lot of emotion uh, right here. And I think a person like this might not be communicating the emotion because we're not at the emotional part of the screenplay. We're not at the emotional part of the story yet. And I'm not saying that that's a deceptive behavior. I'm saying this is how this person's psychology most likely works. I'm willing to bet that he is honest and this is a truthful recollection uh, for the most part uh, that we're seeing here. That's all I got. So you have this cold 40. He's saying it's matching up. Everything's matching up correctly. What the heck? What the hell are those icons here? You guys see that? Install YouTube. Share this page. Bookmark this tab. Forty-five. You just pulled the hammer as far back as I could without cocking the actual. And you're holding on to the hammer. I'm holding that. I'm just showing. I go. How about that? Does that work? You see that? Do you see that? Is that? She goes. Yeah, that's good. I let go of the hammer. Bang! The gun goes. Well, everyone is horrified. They're shocked. Uh, it's loud. They don't have their earplugs in. No one was. The gun was supposed to be empty. I was. Okay. Okay. So it's horrible. It's weird that he starts with that. It's so odd because he's now going to describe the scene as, you know, slowly building up into a horrifying scene. He's, but he starts with horrible. And, but then he's going to say, and then he said it's loud and nobody's got earplugs because the gun was supposed to be empty. But he's going to start with, did she faint? So it, it's not... The story isn't starting correctly here. I was told I was handed an empty gun. If there were cosmetic rounds, nothing with a charge at all, a flash round, nothing. Wow. Cosmetic rounds? Why would you have cosmetic rounds unless you don't, unless you show it to the camera? As you, as you turn it and cock it, you would show it to the camera. But then... If you want to show that, you can't have you can't have fake rounds or rounds with a charge because it, they are clearly marked. So you you would do that in two different scenes, where you would show real real bullets or dummy bullets, cock it, and then cut, take out those rounds. If you want to, maybe the armory guys or girls does that, then hand them a, an empty gun. They look. And give him an empty gun. He would do that in two different rounds. But they are pressed in time sometimes, okay? Most of the time. I don't know. She goes down. No flash, no charge. He's not expecting anything to, to happen, just a click. Which is weird. What kind of shot is that? Why take a picture of a click? Where are you going to put the fireworks? On the CGI? I thought to myself... If something here is wrong, it's going to show up at trial and it's going to look fucking weird, dude. Did she faint? Alright, good. I don't understand this part, dude. This is so odd. It was horrible. It was not supposed to, to, to be make any sound. Everybody's yelling. No, no, no. Did she faint? Like, slow. What the fuck is this recollection? Within 15 minutes or 20 minutes after that. You know, it's not like I, I was in an empty gun. I shot. I felt something in my hand. Then it went like bang. And then people were screaming. And she fell. People were screaming. And I was wondering if she fainted. That would have made at least more, more sense. Or at least even say... Did I shoot something? You know? But that's not at all what's going on. It's like horrible and and people loud and stuff and did she faint? 
That's weird. That the police arrived and took the church set and put the crime tape around it, the yellow tape, and forced us all to the perimeters of the parking area where we sat and waited. She was in the church, and she was not taken out of the church for quite a while. In the aftermath, there was chaos and confusion. But nobody told you what happened? No, no. Did it, you was, know it wasn't until I was in the police station. Hours later, I mean, it was like seeing aliens. It was, it was utter disbelief over the idea. It was unacceptable, the idea that it was a live round. And finally, one of the police officers at the conclusion of my interview, I was there for like an hour and a half or so, she takes her phone and she slides it across to me. She says, that's what came out of Joel's shoulder, a 45 caliber slug. It was a real bullet. Had you known that Joel had been hit? No one had any idea until that police officer, that sheriff's officer, said to me, this is the slug, 45 caliber slug they took out of Joel's arm. And then... He's fucking puzzled as all fucks, dude. He's like, how the fuck can you not know before the cops come that, you know, she's been shot or something? Like, he's puzzled as all hell, dude. He's like, how do you not know that? You went for a smoke or something? And, and, you know, never spoke to anyone while everybody's yelling and, and shit. What the fuck do you mean? The... I hope he comes back on this. The kind of insanity-inducing agony of thinking that someone put a live bullet in the gun. I'll go first on this one. Um, again, really large. So he, he, maybe he figured out that the gun did the, 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 the problem. The gun did you know, was at fault here, but he never, maybe a piece of the fucking fire that came out, or maybe there was something, you know, in there, but he, like a small rock or fucking, I don't know what, you know, and that hurt her, but he never thought it, w it would have been a real bullet. That for him was like, what the hell are you talking about, you know? illustrator setting up the scene and we stand when he scratches his head that's that's ventilation a lot of times you see somebody who is who is wondering about stuff or they're getting heated up about something they're getting worried you'll see him do that he's got some hair so he does that but at the same time it could be him scratching his head and just sort of pushing on almost as an adapter or almost like he's not unsure of what of, of what's happening there or what he's saying um and when he says but nobody told you told you when the interviewer says nobody told you what happened no that's really fast and really loud. And it wasn't until I was at the police station hours later that he knew some that, that he knew anything like that had happened. Um, if I had heard somebody get shot again, and there's a woman laying on the floor, and there's a guy laying back there screaming because he's been shot in the shoulder, you're gonna know what happened. This is starting to sound like this this is starting to sound deceptive because what he does is he not pulls himself about away from so you he, he is starting to say, this this is not being fucking truthful here. Something's fucking weird, and I don't like it. That, that's Scott's. He didn't know the other guy got hit. He doesn't say, no. No, I didn't. He, he keeps talking. I didn't, we didn't know this until the uh, police officer did this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, hours later or whatever, however long ago it was later. This, this to me is, these are bells and whistles right here. Uh, he's being really careful about what, he, what he's saying. This is not, un, it may be unscripted, but he had the answers, uh, the questions given to him earlier because he's ready for that as he goes through. And this guy isn't coming on hard. With him. There's nothing, no reason for him to come on, you know, tough with him because we know he didn't do it on purpose or it's, uh, I would assume he didn't do it on purpose. That seems obvious. But um, but that's, that's deceptive behavior right there. That's what puts him in that category of lookout and, and that thing. Yeah. Just because he has specific things that he wants to, to go in, so so he doesn't go into other things he shouldn't necessarily go into because that could jeopardize his, his defense, you know, if he goes into them. Like, well, I, I thought I, I did, did that, and I, I thought I did see something, and I wasn't sure. You don't want to go into any of that stuff. Um. This, I'll stop there. I know I'm, I'm, I'm humming around the same thing every time, but... Man, this this looks this looks deceptive to me. All right, Chase, what do you got? Okay. There is a huge chunk of missing information here. We already know from his appearance uh, when the media stopped him on the side of the road. He, he's comfortable saying what he can't talk about and what he can. He is. We've already established his comfort level with telling the media that he can't talk about something. 
something, but there's still something missing. If you shoot a person and 15 minutes goes by before police force you out of a building, no one needs to tell you what happened. If you're in the room long enough for 911 to be called, you know what happened. If you shoot someone and they bleed, you know what happened. The, the narrative here seems to be that he just vanished from the building immediately after the gun went off. And people on the scene who he was sequestered with would have seen the bullet holes, would have seen some kind of wound. Uh, so this is, we're, we're, uh, we're at the point of criticizing story and not necessarily behavior here, but this is, this is all what we do. You know, we're interrogators. We, we talk to people for a living. This would be a gigantic missing black hole in the story where everything's falling apart. Uh, but obviously I think this was an accident and once we get to our final thoughts, I think you're going to be surprised a little bit, but, uh, uh, that's all I got. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Greg, what do you think? Yeah, pretty simply, um, there are a couple of things. If you shoot somebody tomorrow, there's going to be all kinds of things go through your head. You're going to hedge. And if you're in this situation where you happen to be a producer and you happen to be the actor who pulled the trigger and, 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 you're going to have some stone walls around things that you should and shouldn't talk about. So, of course, we're going to see deceptive body language. We're going to see him trying. I mean, the first thing you would fucking do if you have any fucking... Uh, experience with this gun is immediately open it up and look at the bullets that you're using, right? I mean, isn't that what like 95% of you would do? A shot, she falls, blood. First thing you do is pick up that gun and open it and see what's going on and start putting one and one together, man, and say, oh my God. You know what I mean? Not just a I don't know what the fuck happened 15 minutes into this situation. I hope we, the interviewer goes into that. What happened 15 minutes in? What's going on? Remember, deception doesn't mean lying. What it can do? sometimes mean omitting information, and you're dancing around a topic when somebody gets close to it. And I think we're seeing some of that. Uh, Scott, I think when he does this, it's more than a simple comforter. When people feel high stress, Often you'll see them grip and rub the back of their head. And I think when he puts his hand up there, that's pretty damn pronounced. For all the rest of his body language, that's pretty damn pronounced. I think he realizes we're getting awfully close to some of those areas. I need to be careful. And that's what I think we're seeing is when he starts to repeat, it's because he's uncertain. We're not seeing a whole lot of that. He is going downright. He's navigating whatever's going on. His eyes widen at it was a real bullet. That actually, I think, is real for him. I don't think his eyes intentionally did it. I think that's an autonomic response to what his brain is doing. If somebody met, scripted this message for him, he needs to hire somebody else because nobody says no one had any idea until. I think that's his brain trying to craft the sentence to say, we didn't know what really happened. But Chase, I'm with you. If you shoot somebody tomorrow with a 45 long Colt at five to 10 feet away, you know what happened. You certainly know. Anything that's lethal is going to, the cavitation from that round is going to make a hell of a mess out of a person. Especially if there was supposed to be nothing in it, and you shoot and you, ha you hear pow, and someone falls. I mean, it's like automatic. It's like, holy shit, there was a bullet in this fucking gun. And there's a history of, of, of shooting on that set or, you know, as an activity outside of the set, probably uh, as shooting uh, targets, so we've heard that in uh, previous interviews. So they were they using the same guns and practice shooting, uh, you know, as leisures uh, and activities. Was it the bullet from one of those activities? You know, that still was in the gun, quite possibly. You know, if there is no foul play here, that's the most probable cause of, of what happened and, and that shows you know and that that checks the inexperience uh armory that checks the actor is not at fault that checks that checks most of the boxes and you you won't be able to forget it when that happens that doesn't mean that he doesn't have all that in his head and all those visuals but has been told shut up don't say a word 
don't know. I'm, I'm just saying if he were in that situation, right. if my friend. He's not allowed to discuss thing or he shouldn't discuss thing. It's either one. Um, and I, I'm not faulting him also for not being able to get into things and repeating things that he wants to get into because it needs to come out. Lah. But it makes for a shit interview, I think. You know, uh, but that's what we have to, to deal with. People want to see that, so whatever. And we're in that situation and said, would rather see it than not see it. Hey, this happened. I'd say, don't talk at all about details about what you know. Just be quiet. And I'm sure his lawyers have already said it. He also says, when he says no one had any idea until, that's blame sharing. So he feels some responsibility, certainly. Whether, you know, whether he should or not, that's a different equation. I think anybody who shoots somebody is going to feel that. And I think as we get to that blame sharing, we're starting to use team pronouns, as you would call them, Chase. I always just call it blame sharing when it's me that pulled the trigger. I want other people involved. No one had any idea until. I think he's working and navigating through here. And that's what you're seeing is, is deception, I think. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I agree. For somebody who is so good at using the descriptors and using the mime to tell us the story and tells a good verbal story, we've got the gap in the story now. We do get some really good geography of, look, the tape went around the church. So really good geography, really good mime of that. But where is the mime of, you know, and then, you know, Hutchins falls to the floor. I run over. I'm doing this. Um, you, you know, uh, somebody over there is grabbing their... There's nothing of that description. Yeah, I, I'm with everybody else. Why? Why are we not talking about that? Why Why don't we get some good storytelling uh, around that? Um, and I think, yeah, everybody could be right there around, well, that's the one thing you're not going to hear about because culpability or not acting quick enough or not taking control, not being a good leader in that situation may well come up. I just don't know. I'm speculating. Well, that's either that or, like, imagine if someone, you know, wants to cover up for you before a trial and you tell on TV what happened from that moment. And and people can hear that and say, okay, well, I'm going to tell that story. Um, or maybe it affects their telling of the story. So maybe he cannot get into those details. Um for, for for some reason so i don't know but but it's 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 missing we're hungry for it of course around that uh, what what is most interesting for me is how he does transference of power um into objects uh, and i think it might be a little bit of a a redirect there greg a, a little bit of, of of chaff and redirect in that he goes he picks up this book and don't you as an audience go what's he picking up what's he doing what's he doing he goes well this is an iphone all right you've just made a book into an iphone and what it what it is is the representation of a bullet because because you know she had the bullet on it and then he puts it down on the table and he kind of puts it a cursory slides it over cursory slides it over i think what he's doing there number one is a bit of a redirect of look at my storytelling look at my mime because it is quite extraordinary and then he's He's showing how the police blindside him and are cursory about it. So there's a bit of blame shift there, or certainly a bit of, you know, look, negative pe people doing negative things over here. Don't look over here, look over here. Um, so extraordinary. And again, control elsewhere. All the control is, I knew nothing about this. I was blindsided by this book being an iPad, being a bullet. Um, that's when his trouble started, I think. You know, also when you think about it, like emotionally speaking, if, you know, when, when, I mean, you, you, you do something for production, you don't know what's going on, even if he realized a second after that he shot her, okay, and then, you know, call the 911. Okay, let's get people around here. Let's go. Police is coming. Ambulance over here, over here. Uh, please help us out. You can spend hours, hours not feeling culpable for anything until the cops come over and say, what about this here? You shot our live bullet, sir. Then they point the finger at you. 
And people all over the world started pointing finger at him. And that's when his, his personal problems started. Like suddenly, oh, he's much more in trouble than he assumed at first. And that's when distinctively in time, his trouble started. So of course he's going to come back to the first moment where the cop showed him this. And he was like, hey, I don't know what you guys are trying to say here. You know, his life changed. His life changed at that moment. His life forever changed at that moment. Not at the moment that he shot. Because it is sad, but if it wasn't his fault, then he's able to move on with everybody else. But if the cop says, what about this? This is you. And the people also say, this is you. Then his life is, is changed forever by that. Um, I don't know, I just feel it. You know, quite, again, quite extraordinary and, and missing data there. There, that's what I got on that one. Nice. Sorry. Within 15 minutes or 20 minutes after that, the police arrived and took the church set and put the crime tape around it, the yellow tape, and forced us all to the perimeters of the parking area where we sat and waited. She was in the church, and she was not taken out of the church for quite a while. In the fuck is that? The fuck does that mean, dude? You know? What, is it because she was dead? Because if, if, if she was dead, it's my understanding that they would rather conserve the crime scene as it is. Okay? But of course you expect someone to go into an ambulance and go to the hospital right away. But if she was pronounced dead at the scene, then they might not want to change anything to the scene. It's a crime scene. In the aftermath, there was chaos and confusion. But nobody told you what happened? No, no. Did it, you know it wasn't until I was in the police station. So I'm just trying to see if, if maybe he meant, maybe he, he, he like blamed, you know, like she was not there or she was not taken into the, into the ambulance. They left her dead there to die. And, you know, that would be like a blame shifting, you know. Like, why didn't you take her? Why didn't you help her? Okay, so they, they did, they didn't help us type of deal. You know what I mean? And then the police overcoming here, not helping him in his situation, hurting his situation, possibly, you know? Hours later. In his, in his mind, not like literally. I mean, it was like seeing aliens. It was, it, was, it was utter disbelief over the idea. It was unacceptable, the idea that it was a live round. And finally, one of the police officers, at the conclusion of my interview, I was there for like an hour and a half or so, she takes her phone and she slides it across to me. She says, that's what came out of Joel's shoulder, a forty-five caliber slug. It was a real bullet. Had you known that Joel had been hit? No one had any idea until that police officer, that sheriff's officer, said to me, this is the slug, 45 caliber slug they took out of Joel's arm. So my understanding is Joel is the one who's, who's hurt, the second person who's hurt by this. In the arm, I believe he was shot. And he didn't know, like, he was shot? What do you mean? Like, it's a bullet, guys. It's going through something, and it's still fast enough to go through a, a fucking shoulder and hit a bone, probably. You know, it's in the shoulder, so there's a lot of bones here. And probably hit a bone and stopped, finally. But it went through, right? It probably shattered his bone. <clears throat> but it ended up stopping. I don't know about you, but if I throw you a rock... Okay, bullet physics. If I throw you a rock really hard a small rock really you know with accelerate with with faster and faster speed is it at some point going to not just fall off is it going to at some point start pushing you because it has got so much speed all right well at some point it's actually not going to push you it's going to go through the the skin 
and threw the bone and shattered the bone. How do you not know somebody's fucking hurt from a, a gunshot wound, even if it's a small caliber, to the shoulder? Like, what what do you mean? How do you not know Joel, Joel was shot? No one had any idea until that police officer, that sheriff's officer said to me, this is the slug, 45 caliber slug they took out of Joel's arm. And then the... And, and the only way that makes sense is if, is if he sees two people that are hurt, he doesn't understand why. He says, is it the powder that hurt them? Is it, was, was there some kind of projectile in there? BB guns, beans, something, small rocks or something? And that I went through his shoulder, you know, thinking it could be something else than a projectile, which would at least make more sense than a, an actual bullet. A kind of insanity inducing agony of thinking that someone put a live bullet in the gun. All right, let's go to the next one. I mean, there's a difference between someone put a live bullet into the gun and my, my previous probable scenario as someone would have left a live bullet into the gun. Two different things. He's not saying that. If he would have said left a live bullet into the gun, that's another check mark for the probable story of, of leisure uh, shoot shooting sport sport shooting uh, around the set the notion that there was a live round in that gun did not dawn on me till probably 45 minutes to an hour later 45 minutes to an hour well she's laying there and i go did she get it by wadding was there a the blank sometimes those blank rounds have a wadding inside that packs it's like like a cloth that packs the gunpowder and sometimes wadding comes out and can hit people and it can feel like a little bit of a poke but no one could understand did she have a heart attack because remember, the idea that someone put a live bullet in the gun was not even in reality. Did you go up to her? Did you back I went away? up to her, and then we were immediately we were told to get out of the building. We were forced to get out of the building. The medics came in. I mean, I stood over her for 60 seconds, and she just lay there kind of in shock. Was she conscious? Uh, my recollection is yes. All right, Greg, what do you got? So this is the only time we see him change dramatically from his baseline. He's got this passionate, over-enunciated kind of New Yorker thing going on, and suddenly he goes, ah, uh, um, and stammers. He now is in trouble. This is a place where he's been told something, I guarantee you. I mean, I, there's rarely a time you hear me say, this is a fact. This I would almost guarantee is a fact. He has eye accessing to his left pretty hard, which you would say three o'clock. I typically associate with something I'm recalling I've heard. And he goes, my recollection is yes. Well, there's distancing from the answer. His blink rate actually increases here. And he does a short nervous nod. It's an odd out of everything that we see. It I recognize that because my uh, part of my job, regular job, is to give information to people. And sometimes they ask a question that I'm not able to get into, but I know the answer. But And then, and then sometimes I may go like, uh, um, uh, and I'm trying to find a way to phrase it so that I don't, you know, get out of what I'm supposed to do. And it goes, and it goes something like, uh, um, "Well, from what I know, and I've heard reports that, uh, you know, so that I recognize." It's out of baseline, and I think it's a danger zone for him. Somebody has told him to be very careful, not to be passionate around this, not to talk about it, and then you also see a little disapproval or sadness as the sides of his mouth draw down. It's out of out of standard. So this is a place I think he's been coached, and the coaching is actually showing. Um, Scott, what do you got? Or Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I to totally agree. We get a nose a nose wrinkle from him, very slight, on when he talks about 60 seconds. So again, I'm concerned about that 60 seconds. I'm like, how accurate is that? I'm concerned now. The story's getting fuzzy for me a little bit. It seems to get, be getting fuzzy for him. It's getting fuzzy for me. I'm not seeing the same mime happening. I'm not seeing the same emphatic use of, of detail. Just as you said, there, Greg, conscious, uh, my recollection, that's out of baseline. I totally uh, agree. Um, you know, so he, so he's not saying however, that, look, 
is it that um, you know my expectation is when a gun goes off, when there's a loud bang, you know, and and all hell breaks loose, you can forget things. We all know that when that when you know you're fuzzy on the detail, you know, before you might remember, but after that gun goes off, maybe it gets a bit fuzzy. So we don't want to discount that. But for somebody who is so, so accurate and detailed, uh, this is off baseline for me. Scott, what do you think of that one? Story is fuzzy. Yeah. And, it, and, it's, and it's not normal because most of the time it's been super accurate. But, but there's, there's also a part of disbelief that came to play here. But of, because, of course, you don't want to believe it. You have you do, you you don't want to you want to find anything possible that could happen, but a live round was shot and I shot it at my friend. Your brain finds every possible way that that something happened here, but it not that. And so you know, was it was it was it due to the the gun going off and the powder, and was it a linen thing? Was it a little rock that that was inside? anything not as bad as as this so there's this belief and that comes into play into the story because because that's that could explain the fuzziness because there's this disbelief that doesn't exist it's not there's nothing true here just your brain playing tricks on you like maybe it wasn't maybe it was just this maybe it was just that maybe it was just this but and and all that time your friend is dying okay so, so that could be the explaining here, the, the fuzziness. You just don't want to believe it. All right. Um, you're right about that, that nose part when in, during the 60 seconds, something's up there because mm -hmm. we get a full on, and I think you blinked, Mark, halfway through that because it isn't just a little wrinkle. It's a full on anger micro expression. I'll, I'll, oh, really? Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, because I was going through. Uh, frame by frame and i'll show it to you it is unbelievable when you see huh. it if you if you didn't catch it before you're gonna you're gonna go oh my god that's unbelievable when he says no one can understand did she have a heart attack none of this none of this sounds like it went down the way it supposedly went down um we were forced we were forced out of the building he doesn't buy it fucking scott doesn't buy it dude that that's what he just said here he's like that makes no sense man i'm saying it could make sense if your brain is playing tricks on you and say, did she faint? Did she have an heart attack? Is something going on? Of course, for Scott, this makes no fucking sense. You heard the bang. People are dropping. People are hurt. People are screaming. Just after the bang, which was never meant to happen. Scott is pissed the fuck out right now. He said he stood over, over for 60 seconds. Then they were forced out of the building. Right? Well, keep in mind... He's the guy in charge. It's his movie. He's the star. He's a producer. And with an attitude, with an ego like that, you think he's going to let somebody force us out of the building? No, he'd want to stay. And how long does he say it takes for the cops to get there and the ambulance to get there? 15, 20 minutes. Exactly. 15, 20 minutes. It doesn't work with the 60 seconds. What does that mean, 60 seconds? But I mean, he doesn't necessarily mean the Scott. I'm, I'm, I'm playing the devil's advocate against Scott here, but. It doesn't necessarily mean the cops forced him out because he said the medics came over and the medics, you know, could 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 say, get out of here, move uh, and make room. The medics come over, the security, probably the firefighters, uh, if there's a firefighting team on the set, um, uh, security, armory. Um, I don't know if the armory is there, but security is there, different kinds of security. Uh, possibly so he wasn't sitting there for for 60 seconds over i bet he said something something went squirmy in there on him something happened in there because he's angry about whatever it was so i think that's why there's something up there it'll come out in in hopefully in court but that's my opinion doesn't mean it actually did i could completely be wrong but i think something happened in there and he's trying to push away from that um I mean, and true, but we're not getting into it he looks braced and he's in and what happened in 60 seconds dude so many things happen in 60 seconds. Then you're forced out and the, the scene's over. Then I go to bed. What do you mean? Offensive during this as well. Um, another thing when he says, I stood, oh yeah, I stood there for 60 seconds. Um, I'll go back to my thing where I, I won't go on. You've covered, you guys covered a lot of that. 
I think there's something up in that 60 seconds there. I don't think that went down the way you said it went down. And I, I think there's something goofy in there. I think we'll see that later on. Chase, what do you got? Uh, the bullets that were in this gun, it, it, if you're not familiar with a lot. Sure, there's something that went down in those 60 seconds. Now, we don't know what, he, what, what went down. So I don't know why Scott is saying it didn't go down the way he said it go down. The only thing that wouldn't go down the way he said it is that they would be forced out of the building. That's the only thing that he said. So Scott here is, is saying, I don't think that happened. Because he he, he disavowed of it. He disproved of it. He, you know, he's like, who pushed you out? Who, are you kidding me? A lot of guns. They're called the 45 Long Colt. It's a 45 caliber bullet. It's about that long. It's about as big around as my pinky. And if you're standing over a person with a hole in them this size, uh, there is going to be blood. There's going to be uh, pain. There's going to be probably a loss of consciousness to some degree, uh, no matter where the bullet hole is. And especially if you do it for 60 seconds, maybe longer. Uh, and suddenly the only thing that he needs to qualify or what we call an exclusion statement when, when we hear politicians all the time say, to the best of my knowledge, as I recall, to my recollection, those kind of exclusion statements uh, is her level of consciousness. It's the only time we hear an exclusion used throughout this entire thing is due to her level of consciousness here uh, after the incident happened, which I think is a, a, a big red flag. And this is after he's saying they were immediately forced out of the building. It's a big flag. I and this comment about her being conscious, I think, is a huge baseline deviation for Baldwin to begin with. His eyes are recalling standing over her at nine o'clock to his to our nine o'clock. You don't need to think it's a huge deviation of baseline. It is a couple of times. And it, was she conscious? We hear the interviewer ask, and he says, only, um, and we hear this long, um, the only time that he uses these kind of filler words there and the only qualifier, there's no eye movement during the recall for the question. There is a complete body freeze during the initial processing as he starts to answer. And there is a nod for agreement as he's saying, uh, to my recollection, he's, he is getting it, trying to get a nod from the interviewer. And I would say this, it was probably an accident. This is likely deceptive or it's likely concealing uh, based on something he's heard from legal counsel. That's all I got. Yeah, guys, a couple of things to think about. Remember the first time you ever fired a firearm without earplugs? Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. Holy, I mean, you're back on your, especially this gun. That's a lot of powder coming out, mm -hmm. all the stuff that's going to go, <clears throat> the impact to this person, the sounds, the smells, that all that stuff that if you've never been around firearms and if you've never been around someone shot, all that stuff together, it creates this world of things going on around you that I can understand how you can't remember facts. And anybody told me 60 seconds, I'd go, yeah, it probably isn't that, even if they're being truthful with me, because your brain goes into a different gear when that kind of stuff yeah. happens. Just that sound alone is enough. But then you're right. This person is going to be screaming. That person's going to be screaming. You may not hear it. They may be in and out. Of, there's all kinds of stuff going on. That somebody in the, any of that is like somebody in that group. Somebody would have said, somebody out of all the people in that room would have said, oh, my God, she's been shot. Or do you think she could have been shot? You shot or said her. to him, you did you shot shoot her? her. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. or, or when you step outside, would somebody get shot? And you the shot idea her. doesn't pop into his head? Come on, man. Well, when they call 911. Of course, that makes so much sense, Scott, here on the point, dude. Just on it, you know, understanding the situation. Of course, it's so much more probable with a lot of people in. That something when they call that like, oh my god, you shot her. Oh my god, you know, just just a simple realization in a, a terrible moment in time. And when one they said someone has been Horrifying. shot, yeah, was it a real bullet? It was a you know, you can listen to the 911 call, you can play it over here, Scott, because they yeah. they mention it. I think we're all on the same page. There, anything he's hiding here, I think he's hiding out of protection, not yeah. in his 
you know, he's hedging because of that. First time I ever shot a gun and, and I didn't have earplugs in, I didn't hear anything. All I heard was this. That's what. Yeah, All I heard exactly. was a whistle. <laughs> yeah. It scared me to death. I was like, you know, I was like, oh. you, ever, you ever shot a gun in a car? You ever shot a gun in a car? No. Holy. No, no. <laughs> the first time you do that, it doesn't matter if you have hearing protection in. Well, That's after I did it, my brother's like, Everybody, you know, I was like, what? It was weird. <laughs> the notion that there was a live round in that gun did not dawn on me. It's so loud, dude. It shocks you to the core. Yeah. Made till probably 45 minutes to an hour later. 45 minutes to an hour? Well, she's laying there, and I go, did she get it by wadding? Was there a the blank? Sometimes those blank rounds have a wadding inside that packs. It's like, like a cloth that packs the gunpowder in. Sometimes wadding comes out and can hit people, and it can feel like a little bit of a poke. But no one could understand. Did she have a heart attack? Because remember, the idea that someone put... The more you listen to this interview, the more insane it sounds. <laughs> dude, the more insane it fucking sounds, dude. What, did she faint? Did she have a heart attack? Did she get hit by something? Did lightning strike? Like, oh my god, dude. Disgusting and... It's almost hilarious, but it's also disgusting. It's it's a weird it's a weird feel. Put a live bullet in the gun was not even in reality. Did you go up to her? Did you? Back I went away? up to her, and then we were immediately we were told to get out of the building. We were forced to get out of the building. The medics came in. I mean, I stood over her for sixty seconds, and she just lay there, kind of in shock. Was she conscious? Uh, my recollection is yes. We, we've all seen that picture of you off the set in that hour or so after the gun went off. What were you doing? What was going through your mind? At the end of... She was laying there, and she was there for a while. I was, I was amazed at how long they didn't get her in a car and get her out, but they waited, and a helicopter came. And by the time the helicopter took off with her and I mean, literally lifted off, we were all glued to that process outside. When she finally left, I, I, I don't know how long it was. She was there, 30 minutes, 40 minutes. It, was, it seemed like a very long time. But they kept saying, well, she's stable. Like, like nobody, just as you disbelieved that there was a live round in the gun, you disbelieved that this was going to be a fatal accident. So you didn't know exactly how serious it was? At the very end of my interview with the sheriff's department, they said to me, we regret to tell you that she didn't make it. She died. They told me right then and there. And that's when I went in the parking lot and called my wife to talk to my wife. Okay, Mark, what do you got? So you're saying that's after the police interview in the parking lot of the police? Makes sense. I mean, the uh, the journalists and the reporters often crowd uh, at police stations when they're waiting for, for people to come in and, and out. Uh, yeah, so the question there is what was going through your mind? Pretty clear question. What was going through your mind? And um, Chatham redirect, I think, blame shift as well. Um, it's amazing how long they didn't get her into a car. Seemed like a very long time. So who are they? Like, can we know who, who they are? Who they are? Where were you when when they were doing this thing that you seem to have no control over? So I'm 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 confused about that, and you're not answering the question. And when you do get to um, an idea of, of of something that goes through somebody's mind, it's you disbelieve, not I was in disbelief. You disbelieve not I felt disbelief. So he's, he doesn't at any point take um, ownership of any feeling or emotion or state of mind or mindset uh, and doesn't answer the question, what was going through your mind? And that is interesting, I think, that he wants to avoid that. Chase, what do you think on that one? Right as the question is asked at the beginning, there is lip retraction. And when somebody pulls their lips into their mouth, once it passes the barrier of the teeth, just kind of goes into the teeth, most of the time that suggests that there is a need for reassurance. And we see that as the question is being asked. And then he says that we're glued 
to this process, this thing that's happening, which I think is an unusual way of saying we were terrified, worried, scared, in anguish or agony or panic. And then ju- Mark, just like you said, completely agree, shifts the, all the pronouns to you for a short period uh, to, I think, A, subconsciously we say this to get other people to agree with us, but I think, B, we're doing this to get this agreement away from myself. Everybody else agrees to this. Everybody can, everybody can get on board with this idea. I think it's important well, here that we note there's not a lot of emotion. There's no behavior of emotion on the face. This is proven science. And you can take a look at that. But there's no discussion. It sounds like you're describing Greg. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, dude. I was looking at it while you were doing that. It's just, he's. I'm just listening. (laughs) That depends on what you ask Greg about. That's true. That's true. Sorry, if I'm man. asking Greg about a time he accidentally hurt somebody really bad. Oh yeah, you're going to see emotion, even if it was 15 years ago. Yep. Unless he did it on purpose, which he was paid to do. But uh, wrapping this up, th- there's no discussion of feeling or how he reacted or how he felt about any of these events, which I think is stunning to me, especially being such a good storyteller, a a wonderful actor, knowing what a good story structure looks like, reading all of these screenplays all the time through his life. This is how you snag somebody's focus and attention. This is how you would have been a great time to start crying. You know, I felt terrible and blah, blah. The picture is after he he talked to the cop. There's a, it's full of emotion. Maybe we're going to see it in the next clip, but he didn't talk about that or like that or of that. You know, which maybe because he doesn't want to cry again. I don't, I don't know. You capture their emotion, and this is how you lead it down a certain path. I'm surprised it wasn't here. And I think that there may have been a attorney some kind of attorney or legal counsel saying you we will not speak about any of these things. Don't talk about feeling bad or don't talk about feeling guilty. Like you look on the back of your insurance card. Sure. It says that don't admit any fault. If you get into any accident at any time, let never us say handle sorry. that stuff. And that's you get in the car accident. Never say, Hey, I'm so sorry, but you cut me, you cut, you cut me or something. So don't say that probably he heard probably an advanced version of the back of your insurance card scott what do you think what do you think yeah this again this this whole thing looks squirrely to me i think he's 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 watching what he says he wants to come out and say something obviously from a societal point of view he sort of has to do something so this is perfect for that we all expect it and i think coming into that when we're seeing that that uh, lip compression i think that might have been from something else because it's it's already going when he shows up so maybe he was asking him something at that at, at that point so that's because i looked at that too and i thought oh, what's going on there so that, that bugged me a little bit so i think that might be what was going on something beforehand but still it, it coincides with what's being asked so shoot you never something like that who's asking anyway Everything. I mean, he's and this one's is one of the only times we see an adapter when he squeezes his knee. Uh, he's sitting that he's sitting in his chair like this, and it, it, he's all you know straight, very still. I, I don't know this whole the, all the you guys have covered this. I'm not going to go back over and make it boring. This is this doesn't sound the way it should to me, and, and that's why I'm not focusing on all the body language right now. I'm going back in interrogator mode because I'd be asking so many questions at this point. Greg, what do you think? He just wants to be there. Well, first of all, the guy is the producer for this show. He has a legal obligation. All the insurance, all of that stuff is tied to the producers, not the director. The director's about the artistic piece. The producer's the business piece. So if you bring in a guy and you start asking him questions about what he felt, and let's assume for a minute he has feelings that 911 was too slow, that she died because the helicopter took forever. Yeah, I mean, it's not just about him and his, his situation. We're talking about the money that came into the project here. So if he fucks up, he can fuck up further than him. And his career also, uh, definitely a, as a producer and his future opportunities or anything like that. This, this goes well beyond just his own situation. 
So he doesn't want to put anyone in, 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 you know, in bad waters or anything like that. And he talks about that or that somebody else caused a problem and, and, and he can't say that. I mean, the guy is held up to a standard that anybody else on the set would get away with saying something. It's kind of like if you're at corporate America and you're in the, in the leadership team, other people can say, yeah, well, we caused that. You can't. And you get in positions where you have to hold back information. I think that's the lip compression. I think when he first starts with lip compression and then when he's feeling a struggle, I think, Chase, that's when you see him retract his lips because he's looking for approval that, hey, I'm not going to be able to tell you this. His head drops down and to the right and he starts to adapt. This is the first time we've seen that. And I think what they're asking him to do is to, you know, air dirty laundry, to shine a bright light on his own ugly baby. And he really can't do that today because he's held in a position of of, of an insurance, which is surprising he's a that gives an insurance, insurance in the first all that place. kind of stuff that he's tied to that the rest of the cast may or may not be. I also see his right hand illustrating as he's downright eye access and he's talking. I see a slight sneer, a slight sneer, contempt at how long it took that helicopter to get out of there. That's why I think he's hiding a whole lot of something. We won't be able to tell that, but he does a deep not, draw in of a breath and he pulls his lips in a deep swallow and moves his eyes down right. I think what we're seeing here is containment and him not being able to say things that he's been coached to stay away from and feeling contempt for somebody. Now, who it is, don't know. Don't know all the details. I can just see containment. Yeah, at, at which point, I mean, he's the fucking producer. He controls most of anything that's going on on and outside the set he he's in he sees all of it and he knows why everybody's hired and at some point he's gonna blame someone who do we who does he blame we don't know that but you can be damn sure that he's blaming someone and he, he by that by today he has a, a clear idea of of who should be blamed here but he doesn't, he doesn't say that he doesn't say that so that already tells you that He's holding back on some things if you still don't believe that. That's it. We, we've all seen that picture of you off the set in that hour or so after the gun went off. What were you doing? What was going through your mind? At the end of... She was laying there, and she was there for a while. I was, I was amazed at how long they didn't get her in a car and get her out, but they waited and a helicopter came. And by the time the helicopter took off with her and I mean, literally lifted off, we were all glued to that process outside. When she finally left, I, I, I don't know how long it was. She was there, 30 minutes, 40 minutes? It, was, it seemed like a very long time. But they kept saying, well, she's stable. Like, like nobody, just as you disbelieved that there was a live round in the gun, you disbelieved that this was going to be a fatal accident. So you didn't know exactly how serious it was? At the very end of my interview with the sheriff's department, they said to me, we regret to tell you that she didn't make it, she died. They told me right then and there. And that's when I went in the parking lot and called my wife to talk to my wife. All right. Well, let's throw around the room and say, everybody give 30 seconds or less on, or a minute or less on what we think was going on uh, and our thoughts on this group of videos. Mark, we'll start with you, go to Chase and then Greg, and I'll wrap it up. Yeah, so I think just as you were saying there, Greg, there's there's liabilities there, there's culpabilities there. What do you think they're going to say, chat? I think they're going to say very authentic, concealing, very authentic for the most part, concealing in precise parts, um, and somewhat culpability uh, or feeling that, you know, he's, he's, he's responsible somehow, which I think we all understand that. When you're holding a gun and you want to be in that position, you have to understand how to manipulate that gun safely. So, um, which which would be somewhat warranted uh, if you would feel that way. I'm back to step one. There as well. So I think some information. Look, checking, I, I, I think checking. it comes across to me that it's well acted out that there was a real accident that happened here. I think after that moment, the story becomes very very 
fuzzy. I think it could be that fuzzy story is a, is about culpability and liability and certain details being held back about that. One other option is that does he feel he handled himself and his team in a way that would be respected by other people? It's interesting for me that he that he is, um, for want of a better word, triggered uh, at the start of this interview by the word admired. She was admired. Did he act in an admirable way during this? I think that might be uh, an issue. Complete conjecture, though, based on all this information that, that has come together and ideas that I have in my own little head. Chase, what do you think? I think we're seeing a person who is mostly honest and deliberately concealing and I think the deception that we're seeing here is not admitting to concealing that information deliberately. That might that might have been kind of a Rumsfeld uh, known unknowns, but uh, I, I think there's some hidden information that's deliberate, and we're expecting for him to say, just like we've seen in past videos, I can't talk about that. I, I don't want to talk about that right now, or I don't want to answer X Y Z question. And I think. Saying things like that will be hard to do on a show that's literally titled Unscripted. Uh, it would probably just be difficult. I think it was an accident. Uh, I think he feels bad about it. I think talking about how bad he feels uh, would hurt him in court or has the potential to hurt him in court. Greg? Yeah, the first thing I would say is this is a person who has taken the life of someone accidentally. I, no, none of us think he put a round in the, in the chamber and went and shot this lady. So just for a second, if you've ever sh hit a dog or a deer or any animal on the highway, think about how emotionally messed up you were for a short period of time. Most of us that are balanced, you, something went through your head and there were millions of thoughts and trying to figure out what that meant. And I took something's life. Now, compound that by a million times when it's a human being and someone you know, not not someone who's trying to kill you, someone you know. So there's going to be all kinds of stuff going on in this guy's head, and it will go on for a long time. If you think that grief is compound, imagine grief at something that you caused. So this creates a whole new – he's going to have tons of guilt – messaging and emblems and that kind of thing just because of that part, number one. Number two, he is a public person who has to do something. This he, he feels like he has to do something. That'll probably come back to haunt him when he goes to civil or whatever kind of court case this turns into. But he feels like he has to do something. He has to get a message out. Guarantee you that there are things that he's not allowed to talk about by contractual obligation. And then there's some that his attorney has said, don't talk about. So we're seeing when people may say he looks deceptive or that, of course he's trying to hide something. And some of that may simply be feelings of guilt and inadequacy and, 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 and. But I see mostly an honest guy who's telling you what he remembers. He brought certain things scripted and he's hiding certain things to prevent telling you something that will cause harm to his contractual obligation in the future or to his family and, and, and. Scott, what do you got? I think this whole thing was to build his wall of it, it's not my fault. Is it, It's not my fault wall. I think everything in this says that from everything we didn't even show in here. Because that's, that's what's going to impact him for the rest of his life. I think Scott is, is on point here. All he's doing is building these. Also, also Scott bricks of it's not my fault from the even the the, the one he's shot guilty. he says she told me to point it at her she told me to do this all those things he's building this little wall of it's not my fault and i think you're right greg i never thought about that helicopter situation before he's calling on everybody so i think that's that's what this is and i think it was it was a goal and i wouldn't be surprised if they're the ones that said hey here's what we want to do we want to come out and his publicist or his or whoever it was and said let's do this i don't think Stephanopoulos came to him and said, can we do an interview? I think he showed up with it, if with the offer, I, I would think, because that's all this is, is, a, a, is I didn't do it, or I, um, it was an accident wall. It's not my fault wall, in other words. All right, if you like what we're doing, please subscribe. Just press that little thing down there where it says YouTube. Shit, guys. Subscribe, stuff, and you'll man. become a, a always panelist. Always and then hit the little red bell and let you know we have a new episode come out. All right, that was good. That was a good one, and we'll see you next time. Yeah, see fun. you. Always good stuff from these guys all the time, dude. They're so on point. They see things that 
you're like, what? They did that? I didn't even notice. And and they, they did. They definitely do. That's when he was outside. And they stopped him. The media stopped him. People aren't living longer. They're dying longer. 